If you don't have your list, I want you to think about <laughs> the list of people that you said that you were going to pray for that are far from God. If you don't have your list, that's all right. Think about it. If you do have your list, get it out. Think about those names, and then I'm going to, I'm going to quote the scriptures as a prayer for those on our list. I'm going to use them, but you think of those people by name as I quote these scriptures over them. Lord, I pray that you draw them to yourself according to John 6.44. I pray that they would seek to know you according to Acts 17.27. I pray that they will hear and believe the word of God for what it really is according to 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Lord, I ask you to present, prevent Satan from blinding their eyes to the truth, just like your word says in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 and 2 Timothy 2, 25 through 26. Holy Spirit, I ask you to convict them of sin and their need for Christ's redemption according to John 16, 7 through 14. I ask you to send someone who will share the gospel with them according to Matthew 9, 37 through 38. I also ask that you give me or someone else that I'm connected with or someone else that knows you the opportunity and courage to share the right words with them according to Colossians 4, 3 through 6. Lord, I pray that they will turn from sin and follow Christ according to Acts 17, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 to 10. Lord, I pray that they would put all of their trust in Jesus Christ according to John 1, 12 and 5, 24. Lord, I pray that they would confess Christ as Lord and grow in faith and bear fruit for your glory, just like Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, Colossians 2, 6 to 7, and Luke 8, 15. Holy Spirit, we know that you are our teacher, and so I ask you to teach us here this evening as we're learning together. God, you know more than anything. We want to follow Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. We want to see others become like Jesus. We want to see the hoods transformed. And so, Lord, we need you, and we say we're available. Teach us. Show us your ways. Um, help open our eyes to see the things you want us to see in Jesus' name. Who prayed over their list? Show show of hands. Who prayed daily on their list? One of the things that I do is I keep this in my Bible. When I read my Bible after my Bible reading time, you know, like Jesus early in the morning, Mark 135, got up, went to a solitary place, spent time with God. I spend time with God regularly every morning. Now, he's with me all the time. That's a good reminder that he's with me all the time. And after I read the scriptures, I open this up and pray. Now, one of the problems I've had this past six months, i got a new iPad, and so I've been doing Bible reading on my iPad, so I need to take this on there. Just things like that. Get Somehow get the list in front of you. I don't care if it's take it on your dashboard, take a picture of it. I've added in, in my notes on my phone a notes section that has the people I'm praying for and the scriptures to pray. Whatever you need to do to help you get that in front of you regularly to make that a regular discipline of practice of prayer. I um, can't tell you how many times that we've come to a place of someone following Jesus in baptism and their name was on someone's card that we were praying for. And there are pictures uh, uh, that I have over the years that a baptism holding up this. We use a bookmark. I use a bookmark where I got that from. I gave it to you all on the page. And I can get you all bookmarks. I just, I'm saying, look here. You know, here's Anthony's name on this bookmark that we've been praying this is why it's so important for us to pray the word and be willing to be used by God. So that's an important piece. So keep praying, pray over the list, but also try to make it a daily, something that you do daily, just a regular part of your discipline. Who had a chance to share the story? What was your experience like? It's good? Good. So do you think that you would have shared this week if you hadn't been asked and challenged to share? Some say yes, some say no, probably not. Remember after the situation with the woman at the well in John, the fourth chapter, um, the disciples coming up one, they're saying, why is he talking to this woman? He's talking to the woman at the well. And Jesus tells them, man, you guys need to open your eyes. There are opportunities all around you. And then again, he says, look, the fields are wide to harvest. So part of the issue is, is you and I get in these regular grinds. I, it happens to me all the time. And uh, we get regular grinds and we forget to remind ourselves to keep our eyes open. And that's part of the reason why we need brothers and sisters and opportunities together in the body of Christ where we're challenged to obey. And that's part also, there's another problem is, is when our gatherings are just about more Bible study and more information 
and never challenged to obey. Mm -hmm. I mean, every time you gather with other believers, I think there ought to be, hey, did you obey God this week? What's God saying to you? What are you doing about it? Ought to be a question every week when you gather with other believers. But we don't do that. We start talking about all the in-depth theology and all this information, okay. and then nobody's obeying. And that's why we're educated miles beyond our obedience. So we're talking about stuff 10 miles down the road. You know, it's like we're talking about running a marathon, and these people haven't even learned how to crawl yet. Yeah. Yeah. You, you feel me? You see what I'm saying? And we do that, and that, that's part of the problem in our culture. Um, yeah. With that, now if you go to another culture where the gospel is is spreading like wildfire, there is helpful triggers. In other words, if you choose Jesus there, your life is threatened. So you better get on board quick. There's none of this playing church. There's none of this sitting around gathering for information in this conference and this event because you can't gather like that. So it is down to business in those places, and that's why the gospel spreads like wildfire in those places because you don't play church. It's either you follow Jesus. And you might get killed following Jesus, or you don't. And, and so that is a catalyst. You know the word catalyst, like throwing gas on a fire. That's like a catalyst. It makes it spread faster. So it's good that, that we continue to challenge one another to do that. And that's why part of the disciple making, when we get there, one of the big things is a willing to submit to accountability. Not someone lord it over, but me saying, I need it. So let's agree to every time we get together, we're going to say, how do we obey Christ this week? What's God saying to us? And what are we going to do about it? You, you see what I'm saying? So that's an important part of discipleship is that you are in agreement with somebody that, hey, I need you in my life. Remind me constantly. And I need to submit to you those things and say, hey, what's God saying to me? And am I obeying it? Am I listening? Am I obeying what he's saying? Okay. Um, does anybody have anyone come to Christ? Out of sharing your story. Um, I had a recommitment. Okay. So right. Just working on asking certain questions when you get someone to a place to where, hey, would you like me to pray with you? You know, one of the things I say, listen, you don't have to have me, but you can pray anytime, anywhere to open up your life to Christ. But I would be more than glad to pray with you and to lead you in a prayer how you can turn your life over to Christ and make that commitment now. Would you like for me to do that? So that's right. one of the things is learning how to close the deal. And I, heard, I hate that language because that's like a salesman's language, but it's true that you do need to learn how to help someone if they're on the edge and on the ledge and all it takes you is a little push, then you need to push them, right? Right. You know, to get them going. So learning some good questions is very helpful. Um, like I, I've been working with a guy three months going through the book of John. The guy's getting stuff. The Holy Spirit's speaking to him, but I could tell there was a lack of understanding about it. He still thinks... He's saying, Jesus is saying all these different ways that he's the only way, but then I could tell that he still thinks this is workspace because he's Hispanic and comes from a Catholic background. Mm -hmm. And so, so then after working with him three months, I finally said, okay, I'm going to ask him these questions. It just came to me. We're meeting and talking and stuff. And I said, okay, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? And he says, yes. And I said, okay, you, you, you die tonight and you're going to heaven. And you're standing there at the gates of heaven. And God says, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And he says to me immediately, well, you know, I got all this good stuff and I got all this bad stuff. And my good stuff outweighs the bad. And I said, okay. Now remember, what have you been saying this whole time as you've been reading John? Who is the way to eternal life? Who is the gate? Who is the living water? Who is the bread of life? I mean, all this revelation that God's shown him. And I said, so... Is that the answer that Jesus gave? And it's just like, all this light. He goes, hmm. oh. <laughs> so remember, Jesus is a master question asker. So it doesn't put a ton of pressure on you to, to have all the answers. It's really about asking good questions. It's yeah. so much more effective than giving a bunch of information. Okay? Yes. And I resist giving information often because I want it to be their truth, not my truth. Right. And far too often people sit in church and they hear all this truth that Mr. Pastor or Reverend has given out and it's not theirs. And so you ask them, where's that found in the Word? They don't have a clue. And often it's stuff that isn't in the Word. That actually worked for me about three years ago when I ate you. Yeah. I just let them talk. Yeah. I actually they convinced they said. Yeah. yeah. Listening, prayer, asking good prayer. questions. Exactly. There's only in it. <laughs> There's only in it. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You just keep asking them. And then and another thing is just to actually get them to go through the scriptures 
and that's something we're going to talk a little bit more about tonight. So, Sharon, did you did we set a goal for how many you wanted to share with, and did anybody reach that goal? Usually, we want to try to set a goal. How many people do you think is reasonable for you to share with? I try. I said I was going to try to share with at least one person. And did you? You blew that out of the water. Yeah. Well, what kind of stretching goal is that? <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah, I you thought blew I, that I, out of the water. My schedule was going to be, you know, packed. I'm trying to talk to somebody. I'm talking to five people. Good. All right. Anybody else set a goal that they said, wow, I, I accomplished that goal? So, I said six and I did three. Three, that's great. I mean, that's fantastic. That's usually the case. You know, I, or sometimes I'll say, hey, let's try five. You know, five's a pretty good stretch. I mean, um, so it's good that you three is awesome. All right, here's a couple of principles I want to remind us of. One is, is that in John 5, Jesus um, said that his father is always at work, and he aligns his life to where he sees the father at work. And the Holy Spirit is working on people's lives around us. Uh, we just need to learn to listen to him and see where he's at work and follow him to do that. And people who are receptive to the gospel are people where the Holy Spirit is at work. And there's a word there in John 16, 8. If you, if you have your Bibles, you turn to John 16 where it talks about the Holy Spirit's role. <clears throat> and this is where Jesus is saying that he's going he's gonna to go away and then he's going to send back the Holy Spirit. And he said, and... In 16.8 it says, When he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and what's the other thing? You remember? Judgment. Okay? So Jesus is saying, listen, I'm going to go away. I know you don't want me to go away, but it's better that I do because I'm sending back the Holy Spirit uh, to control your lives. And he's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That word convicting is, an, is a word that, that they use in military terms among Greek, it's like attacking. It's almost if you can imagine a sword, because that sword will help you remember that conviction is like that. And Hebrews 4.12 says the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged what? Sword. Okay? And so, remember that the Holy Spirit is out there convicting people. Now, it's not your job to convict people. Right? And I know some of you might think you're married to the Holy Spirit. Or the Holy Spirit, you may be trying to play the Holy Spirit in your wife's life, but it's not your job to play the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that happens when people get around believers is that they're already under conviction, and then sometimes with you trying to address stuff, you heap on condemnation and drive them away. Yeah. All of us do it. Yeah. And what I've learned to do is allow the Holy Spirit to do the convicting, and then I come in and do the supporting and encouraging along the way. Uh, because often people will feel condemned by us or we haven't even said anything to them. And so we have to constantly go overboard saying that I love you and accept yeah. you because they feel condemned. And often they're under conviction of all their sin and so they know that they know that you have the Holy Spirit in you and they start squirming when they get around you. And so it's real important that we don't, we don't drive people away that we draw them to Christ. And far too often we drive people away and part of it is because we try to play the Holy Spirit and we do that in relationships. Um, I did that the first year or two with my wife. And when I finally stopped trying to change my wife and started saying, God, change me, change me, it made a radical difference in my marriage because I spent the first year reminding her of how immature she was and how she needed to change and constantly testing her and playing Holy Spirit with her and it created all kinds of conflict and it was amazing how when I started saying God changed me and started focusing on that the difference it made in my relationship and in my marriage and I'm grateful for those days. One of the things I always say is don't don't try to pick fruit before it's ripe you know and allow the Holy Spirit to ripen it and allow God to work and we try to force stuff and I'm very impatient naturally. I mean, one of my strengths is that I do stuff fast. I mean, I, I don't wait around for nothing. I, mean, I get stuff done yesterday, you know. And, and, but that can be a real problem because you try to pressure people. And in my early years, you know, I would just overwhelm people with my passion and my pressure 
to where I had people say, look, dude, I will say whatever prayer yeah. you want me to say as long as I get you off yeah, my back. Leave me alone. So I led many a people to a prayer and they didn't have a clue who Jesus or the Holy Spirit was yeah, really. because they were just like, man, get this used car salesman off my back. Yeah, that's you know? uh, and, and now I've learned how to allow the Holy Spirit to work and operate with him where I don't push and pry as much. I allow him to work, but you still need to take initiative. Some of you are the opposite. You're very introverted, very laid back, and you need a little kick in the rump. I mean, you need to get out there and step on the edge sometimes and maybe even screw some things up because you're unwilling to take risks. There are different temperaments in this whole thing that are at work, too. Um, okay, so when we talk about sharing his story, we want to we wanna move from sharing my story. When we talk about sharing my story, then we want to kind of move and transition to sharing his story and introducing them to Jesus Christ. Remember one of the things I said last week was that I talked about how instead of inviting people into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we invite them to church. And the problem is, is that they get connected in, in, in the church and they sometimes don't get connected to Jesus. You would hope the two would be the same. But what you win them to, what you win them with is what you win them to. Listen to that. What, what does this mean? In other words, what you win them with, with is what you win them to. Yep, you win them with music, you win them with music. That's yep. That's different version. What you that's, win them that's with, that's real talk. That's why this is about just music. Win them to. That's a good thing. So basically, if you preach about money and you come get your blessing, that's what they're going to come up with. Yeah. Yeah, and and so if church is about you show up, check, you give your tithe, check, the Bible study, do a little singing, check, you serve, yeah, well, and we call it serving the kingdom. Yeah. But isn't it funny how when we gather together, it's called a serve us, yeah. and that's exactly what it is. <laughs> it's all about us, serve us. Yeah. So check, check, check. <laughs> Is any of that really about discipleship? No. A bunch of it is not. not there are close. some places that will challenge you to be a disciple. Churches. And some of you guys are part of them, which is good. Not every place is like that. I found a good church recently. They, they, they do that. They yeah. Do that. This is the problem. People also don't feel like that they themselves can share the gospel, so they bring them to church so someone else will. Mm -hmm. And you even you even say that the pastors and everybody says invite people to church. Yeah. Why aren't we inviting them to Jesus? Yeah. That's right. Well, people tell me all the time, well, that ain't my calling. I say, well, what is? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, and it's all I, I believe it's all our callings, and that's yeah. part of the problem. You your life to Christ. You yeah. were part of the kingdom. Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> Guys, can you remember to bring this back next time? Yeah, sure. Okay, because what this is, this is a way I train people of how we multiply disciples in such a way that it transforms cultures. And this is a process. How many of you remember, like, the water cycle from school or maybe the <laughs> rock cycle? Do you remember that? Or even, what do they call the chain? What do they call that chain where the big fish eats the small fish? And Yeah. What is it? Oh, food chain. Exactly. Yeah, the food, food chain. chain. Yeah, exactly, bro. The food chain. You remember that? <laughs> this is kind of a picture of the reproducing discipleship and how it looks like to multiply disciples. Like the, there's a reproductive cycle of biological life. This is a reproductive cycle of kingdom life. And I'm going to show you wow. what, every, what every piece looks like. Certainly. And this, this thing will actually help you diagnose where people get stuck. What, what we call stuckology. And so if someone's stuck, you can go through and say, well, are you, are you looking for the person of peace and sharing your story? No. Well, okay, you've got to go back to the beginning. Well, are you, sharing, are you sharing the gospel, introducing people to the gospel? Yes. Well, then are you multiplying disciples? No. All right, well, you need to multiply disciples. Are you bringing disciples together to form body of Christ churches, and then the center is leadership development? Now, I'm going to lay all this out. I'm not expecting you. I'm just kind of giving you a review to say, man, hold on to this. We'll get into it. That's pretty cool. Okay, so the first thing on your square is, is all the stuff we've been talking about, just so you know, is over here, in that section right there. Thank you, the word. All right, and it's, we've been saying, hey, where do I go? Well, I go to my oikos, and it starts, my oikos is what? What do we say an oikos is? A pocket of people. 
Yeah, it's a pocket of people. It's your relationships. Family and friends first is who you should start off with sharing your story. So when you go to your family and friends, you can go solo. Example, a woman at the well, after she encountered Jesus, she went back to her family and friends in John 4 and five villages turned around and came to Christ and the, the whole village came out to see Jesus because she went and said, man, let me tell you about how Jesus um, touched my life. And, he, and she introduced that whole village to Christ, but she went by herself because they were her family and friends. Same thing with the guy who had all the demons in Gadarene in Mark 5. He even wanted to go with Jesus, and Jesus says, no, man, you need to go back and tell those people your story. Okay? Tell them your story. And he goes back, and he tells them a story, and he went back to a Decapolis, which means ten cities, ten villages. Back then, it's like Ethiopia when I go, even the capital city is like a giant village, even though it has some modern conveniences. It's more like a village, which is different than a city. But anyway, he goes back there, and those ten cities get to hear the good news of Jesus Christ through his story that spreads like crazy. Okay? So you can go solo when you talk about your family and friends, but when you go to other unreached pockets and go to dark places, you need to go by what? Two. Two, two. like I talked about in Luke 10. So that's where do I go? I go to the Oikos, and if, my, if I share with all my family and friends like me, Almost my entire family has come to Christ since I came to Christ. Hmm. That's good. Now, that's, it's almost, what, I came to Christ at 20, 48, what's that, 28 years? Wow. No, 28 years is when it started. You don't have to tell these people and run on camera, 65 year old, beat you down. <laughs> So <clears throat> you start with your oikos, but after you've shared with your family and friends, then I'm looking for pockets of people. And where could those pockets of people? They could be at your work. I hang out intentionally at the same Starbucks because there's a pocket of people there that I share with. I go to the same sports bar with a group of guys to throw darts. So I go to those places. I have kids in sports. That's another pocket of people that I work. And, and they're... Over the years, there has hardly ever been a season in sports where we haven't led someone to Christ or influenced someone to Christ on our sports teams. So kids are amazing bridges for the gospel. We just got to seize the opportunity. So when we're among family and friends in our average regular day of life, it's okay to go solo and share our story and share his story. But when we go to dark places and pockets, I never go to a bar by myself. Never, ever, ever, ever. It is just too dangerous. I just know myself. And so I want people there all the time. There's been a few times I've been PO'd once or twice at the guys I was with when a couple times they left me. And I was mad. I mean, fighting mad. I said, don't you ever, ever leave me in a place like that again. Uh, because, it, you, you know, it's, it's dangerous in there for us to be in that place. It's a good place for us to be, but there is all kinds of stuff that we can fall into. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why we need to go to those places because we realize the desperation. If you put yourself in a sweet little clean box, you, you forget about the places that you can go to. And so it's good for us to go to dark places because it reminds us that I used to be in darkness and now I'm in the light. And it's really helpful to our growth. It stretches us. Where we're going. Yeah, that's exactly right. The other neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's the whole, I'm going to go from my story. That's the, you, we've been working on this first quadrant. And then we're going to talk about over here, how do we get them to his story? And what happens after I've been sharing with them and building a little bit of relationship, then I, I want to bring them to a place where I've developed a relationship and they know where I'm telling them about Jesus, about my story, and I'm talking a little bit. And I say, listen, why don't we sit down and go through the, some stories from the book of John? And so I will say we can meet at a certain time, whatever, and I will meet like a guy right now. I meet at Starbucks at 7 p.m. on Tuesday nights. It's part of the reason why I'm not with you guys out of Spring Branch because that's the, about the only time I can meet with this guy. And so I meet with him, and we've gone through the stories, and we've gone through the entire book of John. And I sit down with them, and I have them. I try to have them read it before. Like before I meet with them, I say read the second chapter of John. I said, when we come together, we're going to talk about Jesus turning water into wine. Okay? And so, 
I have them. I have them sit down. I say, did you read the story? And what I will do is I will try that. They say yes. Hopefully they'll say yes because then they're exposing themselves. And I, I also tell them about you version. Mo most of the guys, a lot of the guys I work with have smartphones. Not all of the places we go are going to, but the places that do, use that as a tool. Say, listen, man, you can listen to this over and over again. Every time you get in the car, listen to John 2, okay? And then we're going to come together and talk about it, okay? So it plays it out loud? Yeah, it plays it out loud. It's in the U version, and so it can play. You can put your headphones in. I tell them, man, listen to it the first when you get up. Listen to it at night before you go to bed. Listen to it when you're on the road. You know, a lot of these young guys I work with, man, they're attached to those earphones, you know? I'll say, man, that smartphone is making you socially stupid. <laughs> but that's a whole other issue. So I try to utilize that technology, okay? So then, then we're going to go through John 2. And when we go through John 2, let's tell the story together. Let's work on the story together. So what I try to do is I sit down with them and I'll tell them the story. And I'll say, okay, what, either I'll ask them this. What happened first? What happened second? What happened next? That way they're telling the story back to me. Or I will say, hey, can you tell it back to me? If they can't, then I'll say, okay, what happened first, all right? So Jesus' disciples, they were followed. They, Jesus said to his disciples, come and follow me. They followed him. They ended up at a wedding, okay? And this wedding was a blowout. You know, weddings were, are an incredible cultural celebration in all kinds of cultures. And this was an incredible party until the host ran out of what? Wine. wine. You know, they ran out of wine, they were going hard. They ran right. out of wine. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus' mother comes to him, actually, and right. says yeah. to him, Oh my goodness, just like most moms do. Oh my goodness, son, we don't have any wine. And what does Jesus say? It's not my time. It's not my time. But then what does he do? Let's keep the party going. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. He wants to pull my lip to his. That's right. And so he takes these these uh, water like uh, cistern or you know vessels, these huge water vessels, and says, "Fill them up with water." And then what does he do? Hmm. Said, so "Take some out of pitcher and go serve it to the the man." Yeah, he says, "Take some of it out and serve it up." It was wine by the time I got there. And by the time he got there, it was wine. But not only was it wine, it was, it was bomb the best. It was the best wine that they had had. Wow. And what normally happens is people serve the good wine what first. First. first, and then once they start getting a little tipsy, they bust out the booze farm and start tickling them big. <laughs> right? So then they bust out the cheap Swindle stuff. Them. That's exactly right. You serve a couple of cups of the good stuff, and then later you bust out the cheap stuff. Mm -hmm. And this was reverse, which made the people say, do what? Take note. Take note. In, in typical fashion, oh, I love this. I get so excited about this because in typical fashion, Jesus makes a hero out of a nobody. <laughs> and I love Jesus because that's what he does. And man, when you tell that story, you say, you know the point of the story is? Is that Jesus makes a hero out of people. So everybody is running around saying, dude, that was the best party ever. <laughs> that place was off the chain. Uh, they had the best wine ever. And who did it? Jesus. The Son of God, Jesus. Yeah. And so he'll make us, he'll take a turn us in to heroes from zero to yeah, heroes. That's, that's what he does. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, boy, you want to go a party. Yes. Like Jesus. <laughs> from <laughs> zero to hero. Yeah. And that's what he does. And so I tell the story, have them tell it back to me, and then we read through it. Okay? And then we ask these four simple questions. Now you know what you're doing here, don't you? What are you doing? You're sharing the gospel. You're sharing his story. This is the story about Jesus. This is his first what? Miracle. Miracle. And notice the first place he took his disciples was what? To a party. To a party. <laughs> to a blowout party where the finest wine in the world was served. And we're not allowed to go to party, Joe. We can't be doing that. Yeah, exactly right. We can't be doing that. The best, wine, doing yeah. that. The best so wine ever. He had have done that before for his mama and <laughs> Right. 
These are what's called, we call them discovery questions. And uh, man, I have a, a whole training that I do on how to ask discovery questions. And guys, these questions have been used in cultures all over the world. And they've been effective across many cultures. Now, one of the things that you want to do is feel free as you begin to, to learn how to do this is to kind of ask your own questions, change it up if you want to make it to match the language. It just needs to be along these lines of good open questions. So it's just four simple questions you ask them after y'all tell the story and look at it. What does this story say to you about people? And you just talk about it. What, you know, and you say, sometimes I'll add to that. So tell, let's talk about the different characters in the story. And they'll say, well, you got Jesus, you got the guy who invited the party, you got the disciples there, you got Jesus' mother. So it allows you to talk about a lot of different people. And, and sometimes you may want to ask the question, who do you identify with? But uh, that, as, you get, as you get a little more time, you get a little more effective at asking these questions. So then what does the story say about Jesus? And yes, what does the story say about Jesus? And you've got all this on the back. Oh, it's on the back. Yep, it's on the back. Each of the seven stories and all of us on the back. Okay? Then uh, what does this story have to say about you? And who needs to hear this story? All right. What is the answer to what does the story say about people? Like, it's going to be different every time, bro. It's going to be different every time. You're going to do that one specific thing. Nah, I'm on that. John 2, right? Okay. What we yeah. just did? Yeah. So that's the thing about this, bro. It gets people discovering and it gets the Holy Spirit speaking. There's no right or wrong answer. Okay, bro. Okay. okay. That's what I want to say. See, and that's the deal. That's the, the, because the way he felt so is how people are trained. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. when I ask questions, people think often, oh my gosh, there's only one answer. Right? <laughs> yeah, You're going to yeah, school. Yeah, yeah. And see, this allows... I, 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 met, I was like, man, what is the answer? <laughs> Give me the answer. <laughs> I, so I already know. I yeah. appreciate that. I appreciate I your honesty because that know. helps us. That is what we're dealing with in our culture particularly. And there, there are no right or wrong answers here. And we train people... Like we're in school, and so and instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to people, people are regurgitating the right answers, and that is a problem. Scripture says the Holy Spirit is our teacher, and these discovery studies allow the Holy Spirit to do just that. And it takes the pressure off of you regurgitating the information and thinking you've got to be the answer man. I tried to explain that to my wife. She was like, okay, so you like, oh, give me the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I try not to do that. <laughs> so these four simple questions. Now, once you get through these with someone, I've got the seven stories of hope and the seven commands of Jesus that you can follow up on one. And this allows you to transition to them understanding who Jesus is, and then use this same type of study to transition into obedience and discipleship. Now, you're, you're doing discipleship because here again in our culture, we think evangelism and discipleship are two separate things. But Jesus said in the Great Commission, go, I, all authority has been given to me, therefore I'm giving authority to you. Go therefore and make disciples of all what? Nations. Nations. And and we've talked about that word nations. It's important for us to realize that that word means all ethnicity, not not this. I'm going to use it. Yeah, not geopolitical, which is a fancy way of saying not geographies with the polit politics. It's really about people. I mean, like you know how you can draw America, and that's what we think of in, as nations. But this this word is in America. There are probably a. I mean. There, there are thousands of ethnic groups and people groups in America. Yeah, this word that, when, that uses all nations is really referring to the pockets of people, the little groups. Mm -hmm. not, not the nation as in the, the boundaries here. Oh, in, in, yeah. uh, I thought on. nation meant like Muslim, Catholic. Well, I, that is actually a little closer to, to the, what it is. What but, but it's like little pockets of people. It's like ethnic groups. And, and now, I mean, there are even different ethnic groups among Anglos. Uh, among, among you know, black because there there are many different cultures among black. I mean, you do have true African, you have African culture, you got Hispanic culture, you got you know all kinds of subcultures. Sub you got your train nine, you got your pirate. That's exactly right. <laughs> 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 
Only, only Jesus could bring that together. So, <laughs> so he said, go and make disciples of all nations. And then he says this. What does he say to do? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Father Son, Son, and teach them to obey. Baptism, teach them to obey. It's all part of go and make disciples, right? And we tend to break it up, and that's another, again, part of the problem is why we don't have any many disciples. Part of it is because we separate these two, and, and as a result, we don't have a what's called a holistic process. I mean, we don't, we don't see that what, what you're doing is discipleship. You're moving them closer. If you can imagine these things as barriers to these people coming to Christ, all right, these lines, and here's this person. Look, guys, your job is just to remove one barrier at a time. Now, sometimes you'll bring someone to here, and you don't get a chance to bring them all the way. But if you have a chance to bring someone even just one step closer, have you done your job? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Because sometimes God only allows us to have a touch with somebody, but that touch brings them closer to Christ. Mm -hmm. But there are other times that he allows us to take someone all the way down the journey. And that's, exciting. that's my favorite time. I love, I love being used any time, but I love when I can walk someone all the way through this process. These stories will help you take someone all the way through this process. It's very simple, guys. You're not having to regurgitate a bunch of information. Jesus is your curriculum, just like Jesus was his curriculum. Mm -hmm. When Jesus said, come and follow me, the first place he took them was not down to Sunday school. He didn't take them to a classroom. He said, follow me. In the first place, he took them to his home, and then he took them to a blowout party and wedding. Mm -hmm. That don't sound like anything <laughs> church does. Man. Now you out of order. Yeah, I'm out of order. Out of order. That's exactly right. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is let's get back in order. <laughs> Let's get back in order. I never thought I would be bringing people to Christ. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's exciting. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a blowout. And any time along the way that you need help with this, I will help you. But when we say M4, I need you guys to see that you're a part of this. God can't do all the training and do this over and over again with every person. I'm teaching you to do what? To, to teach others. This isn't about, listen, in the end times, it says that the leaders are going to gather listeners by their itching ears, mm -hmm. and they're going to sit around with a bunch of listeners. Mm -hmm. But in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, two chapters before that, he said, you, Timothy, my son, as I have taught you, teach faithful ones who will in turn do what? Teach, teach others. others. Mm -hmm. That's multiplication. A mm -hmm. teacher's job is to teach someone else, not gather mm -hmm. listeners. Mm -hmm. right. And that is one of the biggest problems in our culture yeah. is that teachers are gathering listeners rather than teach others to teach others. Okay? So if we want to create a bottleneck, let's send everybody to God. If we want to multiply the kingdom, do your job. <laughs> right? Preach! That's exactly right. Okay? So in this stuff we're going to cover the, what I call this pop five. And these are five missionary principles that come from Luke 10 and come from the scripture. First one is practice of prayer. Because after all, Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, as earth as it is in what? Heaven. heaven. So there's nothing birthed on earth that is not first conceived in heaven. Does that make sense? Does this go like, praying? Does this get up? Is this like going right here somewhere? Yeah, you can put it on anywhere you want. I just want you to remember these are principles of movement and multiplication. These are principles. So practice of prayer. We got to start. By praying. But don't you know there are so many people that sit around praying and doing nothing? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So we're not going to do that. We're going to pray. And we're going to pray as we go. We're going to pray all the time. And then we're going we're to impact pockets of people. We're going to look for the person of peace. We're going to be the power of presence because the Holy Spirit is present with us. And so we're going to show up and love on and listen to people. Did you hear that? Show up, love on, and listen. Mm -hmm. The first thing we do is love on and listen. If we show up and preach without any loving and listening, they're not going to hear. Because mm -hmm. they really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Power of presence. So that just means the presence of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the believer. Okay? And then people of purpose. What's our purpose? To make disciples. Alright? What did you just say about knowing how much you can't hurt? 
Yeah. People don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. Yeah. And it's like you've got two ears and one mouth because you should do twice the listening as you do the speaking. Uh -huh. I don't know that definitely know that one wrong. And, and how many of you have have friends like I do that they spend 89% of the time talking? Woo. All right, guys, that, that's enough for, for tonight. And what is, who is going to get first to the J7 stories? Who's going to get someone first to the J7 stories? That's the goal, is to get someone to going through the, the seven stories from the book of John. That's J7.